All right, Judy, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to participate with us again. So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing you to Judy Glova. And for those of you who have experienced Judy before, you, you'll know what uh, a bright light she is. And uh, she, she focuses on intuitive leadership and leadership coaching and really helping leaders tap into their best selves. And she she uses some I would I would say newer uh, methods, and uh, so she stays on top of all these things. So she's the one that educates us on things like uh, spotting. And um, I love the intuitive leadership though, because so many of us you know question that inside voice, and uh, Judy's going to help us with that. And today we're going to talk about uh, um, the imposter syndrome and and all of these other distortions that that we have about ourselves and um, and what Judy always encourages us to do is to be our best and to feel our best and to tap into that best. So I am going to hand it over to you, Judy. And for everyone else, if you would kindly mute yourselves and um, or or Cheryl will mute, mute you. And uh, and then put your questions in the chat as Judy goes along and then we'll open it up. Judy will allow for enough time to ask uh, questions. And uh, so take it away, Judy. Thank you, Christine. I am so grateful as always to be here with all you boot campers. So cheers to everybody. We got, I got my mug. I'm all set to go. And yeah, so let me share my screen because I wanna get started. Uh, let's see, let me share and here we go. So today is all about, whoops, let's see if we can get this into screen mode. Here we go. All right. So yeah, so today we're going to be talking about going from imposter to unstoppable because truly, you know, depending upon where you are in your career and what, what situation you're in, the imposter syndrome can hit you and it really can impact your effectiveness and your ability to be super effective. So we wanna get started. My main purpose today, just so you know, is that I wanna support you in being fully present, performing at your best so that you can own your power, expand and clear your blocks and make your future uh, more expansive and even have more opportunities for you to shine your light. And one thing I really like to underscore, and I think it was something that Christy had mentioned too, is like, you know, leadership is so important and it starts from the inside out, right? There's a lot of intuitive knowing that we have that sometimes we discount, we don't even take advantage of it or we don't own it. So part of what I wanna do today is really focusing on how you can own your power and clearing your blocks because imposter syndrome is a huge block that so many of us have. So let's dive into, my intention here is also to create a safe space for you to have new levels of knowing, provide as much value as possible, as well as practical tools for you to break through. Oh, and my dog is also participating. <laughs> um, have those practical tools for you to break through that you can use right now. I wanna make sure that when you jump off this call today, that if there's anything that's left hanging around in terms of that imposter syndrome, that you're gonna have tools that you can use carrying forward. Also, I am gonna leave a left time for a Q&A as well as a bonus, so you wanna stay till the end. So we have some another opportunity to find out about how this all works. Um, but yeah, I learned from the last time, I gotta leave enough time for questions. So with that said, hey, the truth is, finding a job is a breeze, right? Said no one ever. <laughs> I know that from my experience in working with some of the executives that I'm coaching in terms of their um, their career transitions, whether they're internally in an organization or whether they're in an active job search, you know, one of the things that we need to realize is that there's a lot of stress and pressure that comes along when we're trying to when we're trying to find a new position. And what I want to do is I want to really want to activate some engagement right now, right off the right off the bat. And please go into the chat box. And I want you to answer this question on a scale from one to five, one being low, five being high, how much is the imposter syndrome impacting your career today? On a scale from one to five, 
4.3344, Okay, so I'm averaging about a 3, 3.5, I think around that kind of zone. Okay, great, awesome. So if we know that this is impacting us, what are we gonna do about it? Well, I like to always think about what are the facts because not only are we looking at you know how many people and what your rating score is in this group alone, but we know that one in four leaders report to experiencing some kind of imposter syndrome in their careers. And it also causes us to accept lower than expected pay. So in some ways we don't own our value. We feel as though we have to prove our worth, but in, in that equation, we're not even connecting the dots to how amazing we are. We all have our superpowers. I love to talk about um, superpowers whenever I'm doing leadership training, because let's face it, you all have superpowers. And I want you to get out a piece of paper and a pen and as I'm talking, think about what are the superpowers that you have? Think of at least three of them. And when I talk about the superpowers, what I mean by that is what are the things that you are consistently appreciated for? What are those things that people say, oh my gosh, you are so good at those things. So think about those because they're going to be important later on when we start to talk about your personal leadership brand. So think about that. And then again, when we talk about employees, people that are in their current jobs, 60% of employees that are employed are actually worried about losing their job in the next six months. So this is a really impactful syndrome that happens to so many of us and it impacts us whether we're in that job search or whether we're currently employed. And how does it work? So the imposter syndrome, as I briefly touched on, it's we have this assumption and it's an incorrect assumption that what we know is so much less than what everybody else knows. But in reality, we know just as much as everyone else. And this is the disparity. This is the disconnect that we have. And that means that your resume, your track record actually proves that you're such a rock star, but you're suffering from that self-doubt while you're not navigating a job change. And that makes it so that there's a huge struggle for you to own your power, to be fully present and performing at your best. But here's the bottom line. Your, your problem is not success. If you're here on this call, chances are your problem is not success because you've already reached a high level in your career. It's dealing with the self-doubt and the fear that's causing negative cognitions. And that's why we're here today. So what do we mean by negative cognitions? These are the distortions these distorted thought patterns that are warped. It warps our perceptions of our reality and it happens specifically under stress. And when we think about these negative cognitions, we think about these warped sense, you know, these beliefs about ourselves, generally we try to stuff it. So imagine, I'm sure some of you have tried this before, you have that beach ball and you're in a pool or you're in the ocean and you're trying to shove that beach ball, that's your negative cognition. Let's look, even look at it as your imposter syndrome. You're even trying to hide that. You're trying to stuff it under the water. And when you think about it, the pressure builds and builds, and it's impossible to keep those thoughts and emotions suppressed over time. And it results in even more stress and even more doubt and even more fear. So there's this cycle that happens and it's natural. This is a common thing that we do as humans. Seven billion people on the planet this is what we do. We try to hide some of those things that we think are unusual or that, you know, we're not like everybody else. But in, in, matter, in matter of fact, one in four people, as I said before, are suffering from the imposter syndrome. So let's actually look at the lens in which you're seeing yourself. Because most often we're quick to make up stories about ourselves based on snapshots of information. And I like to make the link to um, how many of you I go it back into the chat box and how many of you have ever had like a 360 
uh, assessment where other people have assessed you and you've also gotten, you know, feedback from multiple layers, right? So you've had your boss, your, um, your peers, your direct reports. And yeah, so a lot of you have done it. Yeah, as a VP, absolutely. Okay, great. So when you think about when you got that 360 <laughs> and what were some of the stories that you made about yourself based on that 360 feedback? What was one of the themes or one of the stories that you made about yourself? Put that in the chat box. Because typically when people take those 360s assessments and they're reading their reports, they tend to make up stories about themselves like, oh, I'm not a good communicator or, oh, I need to be more strategic or, oh, I'm not doing enough or I need to do more of this or people don't like me, right? I'm not enough, right? I'm not doing enough. That's totally, totally understandable. And when we think about those 360 assessments, I guess the key takeaway I wanna make here is that 360 assessments are a snapshot in time. It's very specific data points and it's basically based on people's perception of you at the particular time where you were, you were being evaluated. So when we take those snapshots of information and we make these broad generalizations about ourselves, we embed these limiting beliefs or sometimes we give ourselves these assumptions and we operate from them. And oftentimes when we expand our focus, the story turns out to be quite different. When we don't just look at that snapshot in time, when we're looking at our our feedback that we receive over a long period of time, we actually see that things are much different. So with that said, I know a lot of you were able to get the, the information before and it was a quick self-assessment. So go back into the chat box again and let me know when you look at the most common cognitive distortions, right? That was the sheet that you received when you registered, what was the number one common cognition that stuck out for you? So hey, put that in the chat box. Hey, Judy. Yeah. Um, just, just an FYI, I apologize, everybody. I was supposed to send that out yesterday and I didn't. I'm oh, so, no worries. I'm so sorry. No worries, no worries. So here's what we're going to do. We can do it live time. That's what the, the benefit of having all the information on the slides. So take a look. These are the most common cognitive distortions. Now, when we look at what happens in our work life, sometimes we go into this all or nothing thinking, right? That statement of I made a mistake in my interview and I'm a total failure, right? Or you ignore the positives. This person, oh, they're just doing it because they want to be nice, but they really don't like me or they really don't think I'm that smart. Or we go into assuming my feelings re reflect an entire reality. I feel embarrassed. So the entire interview must have gone badly. Or we blame ourselves or we blame other people. So it may sound something like my sales team didn't close the deal and it's all my fault. Or we go into labeling like I'm a loser or hey, she's super bossy, right? Or we go into tunnel vision, getting a new job is all that matters, right? We take away everything else that's happening and we just have that tunnel vision. Or something that I have to say that I will admit, this is probably my most common, uh, common form of cognitive distortion is shoulds. I should on myself, <laughs> right? I should have done this, I should have done that. And they should have liked my idea and they must be wrong or jumping to conclusions. She didn't call me back, so she must not like me. So in the chat box, I want you to look at what are the most common cognitive distortions that you fall into. 
Because when we talk about the imposter syndrome, the imposter syndrome has a voice. It's that inner critic that's in your mind that's speaking to you. And generally, it's that voice that continuously beats us up. It is. It has this intention that it's going to help us get in line and do better. But yeah, so some of you are saying, um, assuming my feelings re reflect the entire reality, the should statements, tunnel vision, jumping to conclusions. Yeah, let's see. What's this one? So many times they don't call you back after an interview. Yeah. When people don't call you back, right? You can make up so many stories. Tunnel vision, ignoring positives, should statements, ignoring positives, labeling all or nothing, all or nothing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Blaming yourself. Absolutely. Most of my clients have all or nothing thinking. Yeah. I must be great. I must be an amazing person or I must be totally garbage, right? So I've done it to myself. Yep. Discounting what's been shared. Okay. Should statements and ignoring positives. Okay, great, awesome. So here's the thing. I, I love the fact that we're getting a sense of our own self-awareness around our cognitive distortions because step one is self-awareness. Whenever we're in a, in, in a place of developing our leadership and our, our, our own personal leadership, step one, is self-awareness. However, we also say that it's the booby prize. Just having that sense of self-awareness is not going to get us to a transformation and being able to shift out of it. So what can we do? So the, based on research, we know how the brain functions. And there's two different great modalities that we can use. One is reappraisal. So reappraisal is all about being able to change the way you think. Now, I'm going to geek out a little bit on the brain, so bear with me. But when you think about being able to go into reappraisal, it's you have to be able to still be in that state where you're not completely triggered, where your logical brain is still functioning. So when we talk about your logical brain, it's your frontal lobe, it's your executive thinking. So when, when you, you know, kind of pat your head on the forehead, right, that's your, that's your frontal lobe. That's where you can do logical thinking. You're if this, then that thinking. Now, when you're, you're able to access that mo that mode, you definitely try to do the reappraisal tactics, which I'm going to show you in a moment, but here's what happens. When we get so triggered, our frontal lobe or our executive mind goes offline. It's not in charge. It's no longer functioning. When we're in a huge state of high stress, we're really triggered about those shoulds or our mind keeps spinning. So that's when we have to go into diffusion. And diffusion is being able to get some distance. Why? Because when our frontal lobe is no longer working, we're in that state of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. That's when the most primitive part of our brain, our brainstem, is activated. And that part of our brain has no use for logic. It doesn't care about if this, then that. You can't rationalize with your brainstem, with that reptilian brain, because all it cares about is survival. So you have to use diffusion. So let's look at, so what does a reappraisal mean? And I have to say reappraisal works when you can, when you're still in that state of logical thinking. And it also works really great when you can engage someone else to ask these questions of you. So one of the first questions that you may want to ask yourself is what might you tell a friend if they were having this negative cognition or this stealth talk, if they were shooting on themselves, if they were telling themselves a story and how would you coach them? Because being able to give yourself that distance of, you know, if it wasn't you, how would you help someone else? It helps you get out of the center of yourself and making it all about you. The second one is, okay, looking at what evidence do I have for this thought and against these thoughts or these feelings? So really get in, getting into the evidence 
of being able to get into that logical thinking. And number three is, you know, what are at least three, at least two alternative explanations that could fit this evidence that's coming up or that's appearing to you that you're looking at. And here's the reason why we want to have at least two alternative explanations, because if we only have one explanation, we're basically stuck, right? We're doomed. And if you have two uh, explanations, then you're in a place of dilemma. It's either this or that. As soon as your brain goes into more than three explanations, your brain is going into more of a creative thought process, which literally flips you out of the state of being in that that unending loop of the stories and the negative cognitions. So that's reappraisal. That's number one. Number two, this is the other very effective, is you do dif diffusion when you must. When you're stuck in that cycle, when you're in a high state of anxiety and you really need to get out of it. Ask yourself, the, ask the thought, what else are you trying to tell me? And literally, I've had people go into like a journal writing mode where you do free form writing and you just reflect, what else am I trying to learn from all this? What is this thought trying to tell me? So you dive into the thought. It's super effective. And it's something that I can tell you when I explain it to you, but when you actually experience it, you'll see the shift. I literally just used it yesterday on myself because I was in a state of really being in a, a negative cognition about myself of not being enough, of not measuring up. And it helped me get out of it in, in about five or 10 minutes. And number two is imagine your thoughts as an object in your hand. Literally look at it as a shape, a color. What does it feel, taste, and smell like? I know that sounds really weird, but to your reptilian brain, it literally can help soothe it and help it feel as though it is being heard and seen. And it also, again, gives you that sense of a different perspective. Number three, think about the situation as though you were a fly on the wall, that you're watching it, you're noticing it from an altitude, literally see yourself in a helicopter and how does that change your perception? Take yourself out of your body and witness yourself because sometimes having that new sense of, even if it's an imagined sense of a new perception can totally help and shift and change you. So I'm now going to give you what I think is the most impactful. It's my secret weapon when it comes to being able to go into diffusion. And it's called the three hooks method. So this three hooks method works because number one, we tell ourselves a story. We've already been, we've already grounded in the fact that we tell ourselves these stories about um, our imposter syndrome, right? That we're not enough that we have the tunnel vision, that we're shooting on ourselves, right? So we already know that we're telling ourselves a story. So sink into that story and allow the story to be there. Because as I mentioned before, we have that, that beach ball that we try to shove underneath the water. We try to literally bury our stories. And the more we bury them, the more they stay there. So the more we can allow them to be present, the better off you are. So number one is the, the first hook is that we tell ourselves a story about ourselves. And the second, oops, let me just take a sip here. The second is that we want to be, we want it to be different. We actually don't like the story that we're telling ourselves and we don't want to suppress it, but we want to change it, fix it, or make it different. And the third hook is that we take it personally. We literally attach it to our identity. We buy into that story. So when we have those three hooks, we can actually use that as a tool to get ourselves out of it. And I'm gonna actually work on it with you right now. So you've already identified what is that story that you're telling yourselves about your imposter syndrome. So what I'd like you to do is close your eyes and take a nice deep breath and just allow yourself to be and just be. And could you just allow yourself to be in this moment? And now take out that story that you wrap around yourself about being an imposter 
and notice all the sounds, all the conclusions that you've made about yourself or others, all the pictures, all the memories that are associated with that imposter syndrome, all the evidence that you think you have about that story of you being an imposter. Now allow yourself to welcome the wanting, the wanting to change it, to fix it, to somehow figure it out, to push it away or to hold it close. And now, can you allow yourself to notice how that feels personal about you or who you are? And now allow yourself in this moment, could you let that go? Would you? And when? Now, some of you might've noticed that you had a little bit of a breath, or maybe you yawned. That's opening up that space. So with your eyes closed, and if there's anything left over, any charge of that story of I'm an imposter, I should be more. I should have more, I should do more. Just allow yourself to take whatever's left and put that in a large soap bubble and just allow yourself to let that soap bubble rise up into the air and float away. Now, lastly, I want you to notice that story of you as that imposter on that screen in your mind, in your mind's eye. It was like a movie screen and just notice how that imposter story appears on that movie screen. And notice, are you that story or are you that witness that is aware of that story? And if you look and you notice, you're actually the witness. You're not your story. You're not those thoughts or those feelings. You're the one that's aware. So allow yourself to be that conscious awareness and notice how that conscious awareness is like a huge ocean. It's an endless ocean. And can you allow yourself to just dissolve into that ocean of conscious awareness. And how that's connected to that illuminated light within you that truly is your power, your superpowers that guide you, that make you successful. And could you allow yourself, just for now, to rest as that amazing light that you are? Okay, great. So allow yourself to come back. And as I mentioned, that is one of my ultimate superpowers in terms of being able to support you 
in using diffusion because diffusion in the moment can be so super powerful. So when we come back and look at, again, what our brain can do, we want to be able to access our, our logical mind when we can, reappraisal when we can, and go into diffusion when we must. Because when you're getting ready for that interview or that presentation or whatever it is that is stressing you out and making you feel like that imposter, we need to be able to tap into our own internal resources and be able to shift our energy, to shift our minds. And sometimes our minds are our worst enemy. But the fact of the matter is, is we are not our thoughts. We are not our feelings. We're actually the witness. And how we can control that and get access to that on a regular basis is super important. So what I also want to ask you again is go into the chat box and oh, I see somebody's comment. Yeah, those darn lobes, right? Our frontal lobe gets in the way. Absolutely, Stan. So go into the chat box. And I'm just curious, when I walked you through those three hooks, because first I identified what those three hooks were, and then I actually walked you through a mindfulness activity. So in the chat box, give me a sense of what was that like for you? How easy was it for you on a scale from one to five? One being it was super hard, you couldn't do it. One was hard, five was super easy. How, how easy, how much ease did you have in being able to really disconnect in that moment from, okay, we got four, four, 2.5, four, two, okay. Four, 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 three, three, four, 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 two. Okay. Four, one. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Super. So some of you were really able to access mm -hmm, fours. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, so yeah, so that method is actually called the Sedona method. And it is something that I use all the time with my clients when we need to shift out of any kind of thought process that really isn't working. And when we're in a triggered state, it works most beautifully. And it actually combines, as you'll notice through that experience, it actually combines a little bit of that reappraisal as well as the diffusion, it combines both. And that's why it makes it so powerful because when and some of us actually access our logical brain so much more. So being able to get through your brain, um, accessing the brain to work it as a tool to work for us as opposed to working against us. So this is what you can do. So if you take one thing, only one thing away from what I'm talking to you about today is the greatest advantage you have to develop as a leader is your ability to eliminate your limitations and expand into your greatness. And that's gonna lead you to, to less stress, fear, and doubt, as well as having greater success. So being able to shift from your imposter to being unstoppable, I wanna give you an opportunity to tap into a complimentary 20 minute session with me. And I actually have a negative cognition assessment. I know we did a quick assessment here today, but I actually have a full assessment. It's about 50 items and we can really nail down what are the underlying negative cognitions that are getting in your way. It's really specific. And again, self-awareness is the first step for you to really being able to harness what's getting in your way. So I want, would love for you to take this link. It's bit.ly bit.ly backslash business insight 30 and schedule a 30 minute session with me. And I'd be more than happy to support you. And we can do that by, um, or before I should say June 3rd and stay tuned because I still have one more special bonus for you at the end. So going back to the imposter syndrome during a job search, Research has shown us that 64% of people feel unqualified or, and 59% are assuming there are better candidates out there, that somehow they're not the best and there are other people that are better than them. 54% 
have this feeling that they lack the experience or skills that are listed on the job search. So when we look at how the imp imposter syndrome is impacting a, the vast majority of people in the job search, this is typically what we're seeing. So what do we do in order to make sure also that we're working on a level that's really practical is you need to be able to define your leadership brand. What are your superpowers? How are you going to stand out from the crowd? So first of all, I want you to take out that pen and that piece of paper and play along with me. So number one, what do you value? What are the two things that you value the most? about how you show up. What are your values, your driving principles as a leader in your career? Number two, write down those three superpowers. What are you known for? What are the things that you are consistently told that you have special skills about? Maybe it's your communication skills. Maybe it's your influencing skills. Maybe it's your creativity. Maybe it's your ability to, to see the gaps, to identify what the true problem is. Maybe, you're, maybe your best special gift is being able to connect the dots and be able to see where the themes are and what the underlying issues are that are actually causing the problems, right? Maybe you're really great at the root cause identification. Or maybe you're that person that really has an amazing ability of taking charge and taking leadership and being able to support others, having compassion, right? What are the three superpowers that you're known for? Write those down. And then what are the three things that you deliver consistently? Are you the person that delivers the innovative action? Are you the person that delivers the on time? You have the plan. You're not just the person that sees the big picture, but you deliver a plan that's actionable that everybody can buy into. Or maybe you're that person that delivers on being able to um, drive the team forward. You're able to identify the most qualified people for the team in the jobs that they do that make the team super effective. Or maybe you're that person that consistently grows a team from scratch and can just build a high performing team. What is it that you deliver consistently? And number four, how do you lead? If someone was to ask you, how, what is that process? What is your magic sauce? in terms of when you step into that leadership mode, when you're leading yourself, right? Because leadership does start from the inside out. What are those qualities that you bring out when you're a leader? So let me give you some examples. Looking at my leadership, my leadership values, I value collaboration, trust, and excellence. That's where I come from. Those are my values when I'm hiring people on my team, as well as how I show up. The three superpowers that I'm known for is being strategic, creative, and supportive. I show up all day long with those. And the three things that I deliver consistently, accountability. I hold myself accountable as well as others. I have the agility to pivot. And my clients, I create clients that are raving fans. <laughs> those are the three things that I deliver. And then in terms of how do you lead? I lead with courage, curiosity, and compassion. Those are my three tenets in terms of where I come from. They're related to my values, but they're definitely my secret sauce in terms of how I show up as a leader. So look at your list and look at how you show up. These are the things that people are most interested in in learning about you. And these are the things that you can actually own for yourself. How are you owning these things? So let me check the chat box. Um, I have a question. How are questions two and three so different? My superpowers are what I deliver consistently. Yeah. And sometimes actually, Nadine, you're right. Um, some of your superpowers actually will be similar to what you deliver consistently, but they may be different. 
And I'm just opening it up for people may see what you deliver consistently. It's, it's kind of like, how do you um, contribute to the result is the three things that you uh, deliver consistently. How do you get results? Maybe a different way of saying that in terms of, you know, what are your superpowers? What are you known for? Those are your qualities or your behaviors. Maybe that's a little nuanced, um, but maybe that helps. Let me know if that helps, Nadine. Okay. So now that you have a framework, great distinction. Okay, great. Thanks, Nadine. Um, so yeah, so your leadership brand, if this is something that you have that is right in front of you, that you can consistently remind yourself, because here's the thing, folks, when we talk about your negative cognitions, they pop up when you're at your worst self, not when you're at your best self. So when we really anchor in what your leadership brand is, it is your reminder of owning what your value is so that you are not proving your worth. You are owning your value. Because when we are in that state of proving, we're grasping. We're in a place of our energy is coming from a needy place as opposed to a really strong and anchored place. So when you're anchored in your core of your values, what you're known for, what you deliver and how you lead, it's being able to come back again to your inner core, that leadership that you have inside of you. And let's think about now that you know what your leadership brand is, or at least the elements of it. You want to make sure that you're doing these three things consistently, being seen, having those concrete results, and keeping track of them, having your contributions acknowledged and validated. And then I also like to think about being heard. What strategies are you using to be heard? Word of mouth precedes you. What kind of people are your advocates? Making sure that when you are on a job search, that the people who are advocating for you, your references, that they are speaking for you in terms of your leadership brand. You may even want to share what you've created in terms of your leadership brand so that when they are your references, they're reinforcing your key attributes. Also, are you being heard? Are you being on, you know, are you taking speaking opportunities? Are you on podcasts? I mean, my gosh, what we've learned in this era of the pandemic, so many of us have had opportunities to speak on, on podcasts as experts in the fields that we're in. Be an expert when you can. Take those opportunities because when you're heard and you're being seen in broader audiences, it literally increases your credibility. And then the last one is be read. Are you writing blogs? Oh my gosh, if you're on LinkedIn, and I know all of you are, <laughs> make sure that you are taking advantage of that platform, creating blogs on a weekly basis about your thought patterns. How are you seeing the trends in your industry? What are your thoughts around certain things that are important in your role as a leader? It can be generally on leadership or specifically in your industry. Also in LinkedIn, that recommendation center, I'm sorry, the section called recommendations in LinkedIn speaks volumes. If you haven't sent out invitations to people to, to ask for them to write recommendations for you, now is the time to do it. It is your homework. I am giving you homework based on this talk today. Your homework is to ask at least three people for recommendations that they can put on your LinkedIn profile. People love to read those. I know I jump to those as soon as I meet a new client. I'm always looking to see if they have recommendations and what are people saying about them. And then lastly is social media. Now, I know, I know, you know, social media isn't always something that we want to engage in, but it is something that can support you in terms of celebrating your wins and being able to be visible. I think LinkedIn, again, on the, on the professional side is super important for us to be able to be seen. So anytime that you can use social media to your advantage, use it, use it smartly, 
use it wisely because it literally can help you leverage and differentiate your differentiate yourself from everybody else because the more information that you have and the more you position yourself you are controlling the narrative okay and like it or not every day is a performance review people are always looking to see how you are seeing yourself and how you're taking advantage and leveraging your strengths so here's a new roadmap for you to think about anytime you're doing a presentation or an interview or you're showing up to something beforehand Use reappraisal or diffusion if you have to, if that imposter syndrome is coming up. Reaffirm your leadership brand for yourself. Put it front and center somewhere where you can see it consistently. And when you're in an interview specifically, I love this question to actually diffuse the imposter syndrome that may be popping up, that inner critic. Actually ask the question, how does my background compare to the other, other candidates that you're interviewing? It will help you decrease that imposter voice in the moment. And it could actually be one of your first questions because it's really valid information for you to get about what's the playing field like. And chances are, if you've gotten that first interview, you're your background and your resume is definitely ticking the boxes. And also, I love the ending question if you're in an interview. Based on what we've discussed today, I can see how I'm a good fit for this position and then say why. And then you can actually toss the question back and ask the interviewer, how does that resonate with you? How would you see me in this job? It literally helps plant the seed that you are the fit, that you do connect the dots because you've already, asked, you've already asked the question of how you compare to everybody else and then you've answered it at the end. It's a great strategy that I've used with my clients and I've definitely coached people to use it and they've really felt good about it. So I'd love to open it up to questions. So please have, have uh, give, us, give yourself a chance to, I don't know if everybody can unmute yourselves. Yes, you, you can unmute yourself, ask a question or put it in chat and, and uh, Judy will answer. Yeah. We have just a few more minutes. So get those questions in while we have Judy. Yeah, or if you have any key takeaways, any comments. Patricia has a question. Hand yeah. Raised. Hi. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, Judy. Um, question for you as it relates to recommendations, because I'm just curious because there ha you, there, you have to be have worked previously together, right? So, is there any way to get around that? Where if you wanted to get a recommendation based on like networking groups that you're doing, it, how do, how can we get a, around that? So, um, so you want a recommendation from someone that that knows you through networking. Just as an example, I mean, the way that I see it, you can only do recommendations if somebody's previously worked with you at one of your companies, correct? Is that, or is that not accurate? No, no, actually, if right. you go into LinkedIn, there's actually several different options. Um, and it could be somebody that has seen you, let's say you're, you're a public speak, let's just say you do a public mm -hmm. speaking or something like that. Um, and they witness you on stage or they're mm -hmm. somehow, they're somehow able to see your talent. I first would ask the question, how are they observing you and what specifically, what is the type of feedback that you want them to give you a recommendation on? Mm -hmm. I kind of think you need to reverse engineer it first. So yeah. think about what's, uh, that's, that's actually how I would approach it. Um, mm -hmm. what, what, what would you think would be something that someone in your networking group would be able to um, give you a recommendation about and volunteering patricia you do a lot of on volunteering yeah and i and i've actually had the volunteering people um write about me but that was one specific thing where and i don't want to take up all the time but where the the person i volunteer with she's like i have to be show that we work at the same place in order for me to write a review about you no 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 you, you know you can select that it's a peer you can mm -hmm. select that it's, I forget what the categories are, but yeah, there's mm -hmm. like seven or eight different um, okay. options. Yeah. So
So, and, and yeah, and people can totally observe you being a great problem solver mm -hmm. or being strategic or, you know, again, those types of behaviors, make sure that they're behavior based and make yep. sure that they align with your leadership brand. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. And All I know right. there's a couple of questions in the chat. <laughs> Any other questions? So many times. I think there's a couple in the Okay. So here's something. So many times in interviews, there's a very poor follow-up. I was told that I was top two and never heard back from the company. So many times it is missing feedback. Love the questions to the end, but sometimes you still do not get back, uh, get feedback after the interview. Um, true. Totally. So how, um, and, and let's see the name on this, Daniel. So um, Daniel, I would probably also ask to what extent, I mean, I'm sure, I'm guessing that you've written some kind of follow-up uh, email, obviously to communicate your interest in the position. I would also wonder um, who else in the organization did you speak to that you can follow up with? Because sometimes it's not just the, you know, if, you're, if you go through multiple interviews, um, there may be one or two other people that may respond to, and it may be just not the, you know, not only the hiring manager, but maybe there's other people like the HR person or something like that. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any opportunity for you to reach out to them. Well, actually, Judy, I was told by the general manager that the only way I got to him on a Friday is I was top two. And I said, thank you very much. And we had a very good discussion. It was over Zoom. And he said, I'd be going to a panel interview. Oh. And, and then zero. I heard nothing from him. I wrote him back. Nothing from HR and nothing from the hiring manager. Just nothing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to overemphasize over that, but it just... I can't put my finger on why people can't even write you an email. Thank you for your time, Dan. But, you know, we're going in a different direction or something like that. Just anything, right? Other yeah. than they, they give you, the, they give you the, the neutral email because they're afraid of legal issues or whatever. And it, it's how do you build a relationship in the interview process so that, you know, people feel as though they want to give you feedback, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and I think too, we have to, I mean, there's two things that come to mind. Um, we, I, we're at a time. Can we oh. just finish your thought and then we've got to, we've got to go. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I actually would try a different tactic and maybe see if you can make a phone call to the company or to the HR person. Sometimes email gets lost. Um, so that's one quick strategy I would give. But thank you, Christy. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so you said you had one last yes, thing. I had one, okay. last, I had one last bonus. So the first seven people that want a private um, diffusion session, um, please go to my, uh, my email, info at judyglova.com. And I will set up a time for you, the first seven people, you'll get a private diffusion session based on your negative cognitions. We'll do a negative cognition assessment and a diffusion session and the first seven people. So I look forward to connecting with all of you. And I just send you so much positive mojo for your moving forward outside of this imposter syndrome and being totally unstoppable. Judy, thank you so much. This was really interesting. The roadmap, planting the seed and all of the, the different uh, approaches, very, very uh, helpful. And, and I think, you know, something that we can all execute on. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. It was great to see you. We look forward to having you uh, again, hopefully soon. And um, bye everyone. Enjoy the weekend. We'll see you in a couple weeks and uh, reach out to Cheryl if you want a mug. And if you have uh, referrals for boot camp coming up in June. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.